Hi everybody, I'm Mary Kay. We're going to talk a little bit at this session about some of the softer sides of um, science related to owning your own health. And what does that mean? I kind of looked at this title and said, I'm not even sure I like the title. And then the more I thought about it, and the more I thought about it, I thought, maybe it's okay. You know, we own a car. We own our home, some of us are fortunate enough. So why can't we own our health? We certainly pay enough for it, right? And we have to make major decisions when we buy a car and how to use it and how to make the most of it. So let's try to figure out how to make the most of our own health and what parts of that are we responsible for and should be responsible for. Okay, so let's get moving. Well, why are we here? We're here because multiple sclerosis is a chronic progressive disease. So. We all know that. We've known that for years and years and years. But what I want to impart on you is that your decisions can affect your outcomes. And really, it's your decisions to make good healthcare choices that make a positive outcome. Now, can any of us make you 100% perfect and back to normal? No. Your destiny is not predetermined. You have control over that. We don't necessarily have 100% control over MS, but we certainly can help you help yourself to make your life more fulfilling and more sustainable for you. When we talk about health in the MS Center of St. Louis, we're talking about the whole body health. We're talking about the wellness of body, mind, and spirit. And I think that may be a little bit unique. I think that, as I'll point out through the presentation, is that if we don't talk and think about the, all three aspects, we're missing the boat. And we need to help you think of your whole person and how we can find the best life balance. Okay, I'll go through some examples as we go. Now, healthcare sh is the partnership. That looks so obvious, doesn't it? But let's dissect that, and I'm gonna read this um, verbatim. It has been long recognized that uh, successful medical care requires an ongoing collaborative effort between patients and healthcare providers. All right, let's think about that. Ongoing, you have a chronic disease. Ongoing means we need to be involved throughout your lifespan of that disease. That it's not just an episodic event here and there. We wanna know what's going on, ongoing, throughout your life with MS. It's collaborative. It's not about us telling you what to do. It's a truly a partnership. And partnership implies two different parties. It is collaborative. And like all relationships, especially ongoing relationships, it takes effort. It takes effort on our part as healthcare <coughs> providers. It takes effort on your part as the person with MS. It takes effort on the family member, the support system of that person with MS. Healthcare providers and patients are bound in that strong partnership that requires both individuals to take an active role in the healing process. It's not a passive process. Nothing about health is passive. We have to make sure that we're active participants as healthcare providers and as persons with MS. Now we have the responsibility to provide you healthcare services. That's what you've bought into. That's what the part of your purchase of your healthcare is you've bought into us being excellent healthcare providers and being very knowledgeable about MS. We were very fortunate in that many of our staff got to attend the National MS meeting uh, that it's called the Consortium of MS Centers Coalition that just had their annual meeting. We were able to go there. It was a wonderful opportunity to, for us to learn, stay engaged, and be on the edge of what's new in MS. That's our responsibility to stay up to date. It's our responsibility to make sure that your care is grounded in science 
and that we are well informed and that we pass that information on to you. It's your responsibility to listen to us, but not only listen, but to communicate. And there's a difference. You know, God gave us one mouth and two ears for a reason. We are to communicate as healthcare providers with patients, and we need to take time to listen. Again, in that partnership, we will offer you some suggestions for diagnosis and for treatment. We will make some recommendations, but it's your participation that allows adherence to make sense. And it is your participation in that active, collaborative decision-making that makes us come to a plan together, that makes us say, will this work for you? Is this something that is doable? You know, I often, in my exam room, when I'm seeing patients, and I'll always kind of put together in a summary, I, say, I usually say, and I almost say it almost like this. If anybody's been in there recently, they may have heard me say, in a perfect world, I would like A, B, C, and D. Now, of those A, B, C, and D, what makes sense to you? What do you like about A, B, C, and D? What are barriers for you for A, B, C, and D? And what's a doable action? Where can we move? So we're setting up a plan in the beginning that is, again, collaborative, and that we've identified barriers and possibility, what possible ways to overcome those, but it has to be doable and you have to believe that. And we'll come to that in just a little bit. Wellness, you know, wellness is a buzzword these days. We're all talking about wellness. We just did a wellness survey so that we got a discount on our health insurance within Mercy. And I believe, I believe in the concept of wellness, but wellness is not just the absence of disease. It's really, imparting and embracing the ability to maintain and promote a prevention approach to, um, to life. And again, it's not just your health, but it's what's going on socially and emotionally. How are you functioning in those domains? Wellness can be defined as an active process through which you become aware of and make choices to a more successful existence. Remember I said we can't make you 100% again, but I will tell you we certainly can help with your active participation to make your wellness appropriate so that it, you are and do have a healthier, healthier and happier existence in life because really Although you might have some tingling down your foot or your leg, it doesn't quite matter if the rest of your life is in balance. Wellness is an, a positive approach to living, an approach that emphasizes the whole person. It's the integration, as I said many times now, of body, mind, and spirit. Now, I'm gonna dissect that a little bit. So, cause when we're in the exam room, we can do the neurological exam and hit you on the knee and see how your body's doing, right? We have some, some measures of that. We can ask you questions. How are you functioning? Can you walk up and down the steps? Is laundry difficult? How are things going? Can you get, are you driving okay? How is your body doing? Is it failing you? Are you getting some exercise? Are you running? Are, you, are your hands numb? Are you dropping things in the kitchen? We can find that, okay? And I think that's part of our job, and we certainly do that pretty well. We also want to find out about your mind. How are you thinking? How are things going at work? Are you able to balance the checkbook? How is your mood? Are you crabby? Are you grouchy? Are you anxious? How are those things? And we need to pay attention to that because that is just as important as if you have some numbness or tingling in your feet. Spirit, now what does that mean? We could say that's your religious beliefs, your religious foundation, and we'd be right. How are you in spirit, your spirituality? How are you in connected to your higher being? But I think it's a little bit more than that. 
When I think about this, again, it's that kind of what makes you a person? What makes you whole? What gives you a sense of well, wellness being? How is your social health? Do you get out? Do you talk on the phone? Do you text people? Do you Facebook people? How are your interpersonal relationships? That's part of spirit. Vocation. What are you doing? Are you fulfilled? Are you going and clocking in and clocking out and not feeling fulfilled at work? Or do you feel a sense of purpose within your, within your job? How, again, is your vocational health? That's appropriate. Now, people that, with MS that leave the workforce suffer a loss in this realm. And it's that vocational health that we have to help promote. Maybe it's not, I'm, I have a vocation at work anymore, but maybe, you know what? I am gonna be the best counter wiper in my kitchen than everybody's ever, ever seen because I can wipe the counters. Okay, so vocationally, how am I doing? Whether it is physically in a workplace or my vocation within my family unit. Recreation. What do we do for fun? What fulfills you? What gives you joy? Is there anything that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing? Because it's just kind of a bunch of wasted energy. Really, thinking about all of those things allows us to have a glimmer and a glimpse of what you are as a whole person and how that wellness is playing, playing out. Now, um, People that have seen me in the exam room know that I'm pretty chatty. And I will tell you, part of that, and I think Dr. Green and Dr. Rashway will also say, you know, when we do that physical part of the exam, that's probably maybe 10% of what we're doing. And when we're chatty, what we're doing is getting, again, a mirror, a look inside of you, and, and constantly trying to evaluate how is the rest of you doing? Kind of what does the rest of you look like? And sometimes we ask, sometimes we interpret, sometimes we just look for validation. How are things going? How is work? How is your home? How is your social being? How are you getting out? Do you have friends? All these questions that we ask because we're paying attention to overall wellness. I had the opportunity um, just yesterday, in fact, uh, to talk to somebody who's been in the MS practice, our practice, for 10 and a half years, and I had not met her. And I walked in and she said, you know, I'm fine. My MS is fine. I haven't had a relapse. My disease is exactly as it was. My drug is good. I'm having no problems with it. Everything's great. I said, well, let me just turn around and walk out, because it was about three minutes, and I got my, my body part finished. But I said, you know what, I don't know you. I want to know more about you. Tell me about you. And so then she went on to tell me about her life, tell me about her history with MS, tell me about kind of what her vocation was, what was she was doing. And underlying some of this, we were able to tease out that she had some stressors and some stressors related to some interpersonal relationship issues. And so we were able to talk through that, and we were able to talk about some suggestions and offer some counseling for her. Now, if I would have walked out after five minutes, we would have never gotten to that. And she might not have ever felt the need or the nudge, probably is a better word, to take the steps to help mend her relationship with her daughter. And so that is, again, when we're talking about wellness, it's not just the body. We want to think about these other states of health. So we can preach and preach and preach, but what do you need to do? You have to be committed. You have to be committed to health maintenance through enhancing your behaviors that are, that are wellness behaviors, health-promoting behaviors. You know, we've seen lots and lots and lots, and if you, th and if you ever look at kind of um, the goals from the Medicare about healthy lifestyles, it really is about prevention. Preventing diseases, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, et cetera, et cetera. So the choices we make every single day 
can have a positive effect on our overall health or can have a negative effect on our overall health. And I think illness can be prevented by those choices. We can choose. Don't anybody tell me I sh can't choose to go out in the sun t later today, though, because um, <laughs> I really need to do that. We've had a lot of uh, vitamin D deficient days these days. So again, it's those choices that we make every day. And we have to own those. Remember that owning your health? We have to have some personal responsibility in the choices that we make that can prevent illness and promote overall wellness. You know, at this conference last year, this, the CMSC conference that I was um, referring to, one of the top MS experts got up and said, wellness and health promotion is a treatment for MS. Said, it's about time. So again, it's a treatment for all of us. And again, if we keep people, our goal is if we, if we approach you and if you approach yourself with optimal wellness, managing MS and the whole body, meaning body, mind, and spirit is much easier. All right, so how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to examine your own sense of locus of control. <laughs> locus of control uh, is an orientation. It's a belief about whether the outcomes of our actions are contingent on what we do or that's internal locus of control or are they contingent on events outside of us, out of our personal control, external locus of control. Okay? Now, it, you look at the statement and you say everybody wants internal locus of control, right? I want internal locus of control. Why? We, you know, that's obviously the best one. We all want locus, in control, internal locus of control, right? Doesn't that seem like that's what we should choose? Well, first of all, we all have both. And it's our ability to be fluid through our locus of control that leads us to success. So let me give you some examples. Um, being able to adjust our locus of control is important. I consider myself probably grounded in internal locus of control. Okay, again, that's what I would choose, right? But I can tell you, I do not want the dentist to ask me in the middle of drilling my tooth, if I have a cavity, how many RPMs he should put on the drill. I really don't want that much control. I really don't want the roofer, when they're putting a new roof on my roof, to ask me what size roofing nails to use. I don't care. I just want the roof done. So again, sometimes we <coughs> want to exceed our locus of control to those that may know better. Not only may know better, but that we may trust. And I think that's the key, that there's that trust and their, their partnership in shifting through that locus of control. You know, if somebody is having a, a heart attack and you're in back in the ambulance, you're not gonna really sit up and say, how much medicine are you giving me? What's that dose? Again, we exceed that locus of control, even if we have a strong locus of control, to those that know best. All right, those with internal locus of control tend to work hard to achieve the things that they want. Remember, they believe they can do it. They find confidence in their challenges. They tend to be physically healthier. They report being healthier and more independent. Often, they have more successes. More successes in the workplace, more successes at school, more successes at home. They take responsibility for their own actions which is really, really important. They tend to be less influenced by other people's opinion. Sometimes not so good if it's in the middle of a relationship or in a kind of a superior boss kind of situation. So sometimes people with strong locus of control tend to butt heads with other people with strong locuses of control. So again, I think people are laughing because they might identify that within their own dynamics. 
I think it's important to always fall back on that communication skills. People with strong internal locuses of control often do better on task when they're allowed to work at their own pace. And that's really, really important. You know, I think as healthcare providers, well, as a society, we're all about instant gratification. We want an immediate fix. We want something easy. And we really have to say, you know what? It's not about what I want. It's about you. Where are your goals? And how do you want to get there? And how long might that take? So I think thinking about that and developing that communication and that plan with your healthcare provider is important. And people with a strong internal locus of control have a strong sense, sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy, we're going to see a couple slides about this coming up, but really is the belief in one's ability to accomplish a task. So they have their own internal confidence, essentially. OK, those with external locus of control blame outside forces for their circumstances. Oh, the dog ate my homework kind of uh, excuse kind of thing. Oh, the bill got lost in the mail kind of thing. Often credit for luck or chance. Um, the, oh, oh, sorry often credit luck or chance for their successes. They don't own it. They don't own their failures either, but they don't own their successes. Oh, that was, I just got lucky. I just got lucky that that happened. They don't believe that they can change the situation through their own efforts. They frequently feel hopeless or powerless in the face of difficult situations and are, are prone to experience learned helplessness. Um, let me give you the definition. It's a behavior in which one is forced to endure something adverse, painful, or unpleasant. And, it be, and they become unwilling or unable to avoid subsequent uh, encounters with the stimuli, even when there's an escape. So it's doing and exposing to yourself to something that you know is unpleasant or you know is not right and you just get stuck. I'm just going to continue to do it. And they, you never can see a way out. Um, often, it's what's the point in trying kind of attitude. Now, I'll give you a, a concrete example. God love my father, rest in peace. He could do anything. He could fix anything. He could, whether it be electrical, plumbing, carpentry, whatever. He could do it all. Cars, whatever. I, I'm not sure he ever tried planes. Um, but he was the worst teacher ever. And when we were early in my marriage, my husband would try, because he hadn't had exposure to somebody that was so handy, he tried to learn. And my father, like I said, was a horrible, horrible teacher. And so my husband got fed up and he said, your dad just takes over. He just does it all. He's not telling me how to do anything. And finally, he said, I'm going to try it on my own. And so I can tell you, we had three flooded basements with him trying to change the water filter in the refrigerator, do something with the toilet, and do something in the sink. And he just said, well, what's the point? I'm not even going to try anymore. I'm not going to be able to do carpentry. I'm not going to be able to do electric. I'm not going to be able to do plumbing. There's no point in trying because I'm a failure. And really, that's learned helplessness. He had, he had failures and failures and never saw that there was a way out. Now, how do you get unstuck from that? First of all, he has to be open to um, learning new things. He has to be open to learning the way out. So let, he, and he would not go to my father and say, can you help me? Oh, for God, no, no way would he do that. He wouldn't even call and say, hey, this kind of went wrong. So, of course, you know, we live in the day and age of YouTube. So he figured out how to change the toilet and the wax ring on YouTube. 
Um, and today, actually, he is changing a bolt on the toilet on YouTube. And so he found a way out of that learned helplessness because he was able to gain internal locus of control. He said, OK, I'm not going to be beat up by this. I know I failed. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to look for my resources. And I'm going to figure out how to uh, manage the situation without having to go to my dad. So, what is your outlook? Let's go through some of these quick questions. I often feel that I have little control over my life and what happens to me. People rarely get what they deserve. It isn't worth setting goals or making plans because too many things can happen that are outside of my control. Life is a game of chance. Individuals have little influence over the events of the world. Painting any kind of picture? Or, if you work hard and commit yourself to a goal, can you, you can achieve anything. There is no such thing as fate or destiny. If you study hard and are well prepared, you can do well on exams. Take that and extrapolate that into other life situations. Luck has little to do with success. It was mostly a matter of dedication and effort. In the long run, people tend to get what they deserve in life. Guess which one's which? Internal or external? External. Internal or external? Internal. All right, so internally oriented people are more likely to engage in positive health behaviors. They generally have an overall better health. They engage in health uh, maintenance and activities. They cope better, and they are more adherent. Now remember, I said we all live on the spectrum and we choose sometimes where we have control and where we want to succeed that or exceed that control. Um, but there are times that we can't. We may want this, we may desire this, but sometimes things are out of our control. So what do we do? There is a difference between a desire to control and a locus of control. And I think we always have to go back to where's our locus of control? Where, where are we coming from? Do we have control of this? Um, I'll give you another example. Um, many years ago, uh, a friend of the family was involved in an accidental death. And it was, he was in eighth grade, so as a 14-year-old kid, and he had this accidental death devastated not only his family, but our school community, the church community, and many, many, many of his friends. And he was best friends with my, one of my sons. And we all felt out of control. We had no locus of control. But I can tell you, I had a strong need, a strong desire to have control. You know, and talk about self-exposure, here it is. We were actually out of town and came back in kind of for the whole events related to this. But I found myself in a resort with a kitchenette and a little outside deck, but with such a strong desire for control, I sat there and organized their knife and fork drawer. Now, is that crazy or what? But that was my desire for control because I had no control. I swept the outside, outside porch in the spring, oak trees hanging over four times in about two hours because I felt like I needed control. So our desire for control sometimes takes over and may not necessarily be healthy. That, those were not healthy behaviors. But I did not know what else to do. So to get through that, we had to maintain then and move to a different locus of control. 
And that was, okay, how can, how can we help the family? How can we bring the community together? How can we set up services for these kids? How can we get past that? Who cared what the knife and fork drawer looked like? I needed to change my focus and say, what did these, what, how can we move that? And how do these kids need that? Another, another one is, again, I feel like I have a pretty strong locus of control, and sometimes it gets me into big trouble. Uh, but I also feel that I know when to give that up. And so not too long ago, my husband was in the emergency room. They don't know I talk to them. I talk to you guys all about our life stories. So if you ever meet them, don't tell them I ever said anything about this. But not too long ago, he was in the emergency room with some chest pain. And I was across the country in um, Indiana. And he, he, I said, should I come home? No, 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 don't come home, don't come home, kind of that martyrdom. And so I sent my, my adult children to the ER to be my eyes and ears so that I could at least know what was going on. But at that time, I knew I did not have control of the situation and I had to be okay with that. I had to be either okay, hop on the plane and come home and have control, or okay, figure out how I can solve this another way. Remember that finding the path through the back door? And so my children did go to the ER. Remember, they're older now. They can communicate with me and were my eyes and ears. And people were asking me, well, what's his troponin level? What's his cardiac enzyme level? What's this? What's his O2? Is his numbness better? What did they give him? What did they treat him with? Which would be questions that I would ask because I wanted that control, but I didn't. And I just had to trust that he was in good care and that I was getting the information I needed. And so again, I had to move through that continuum of locus of control. He's fine, everything's fine, trust is fine, kids did a great job and I didn't have to come home. But it's an example of when you have to just make good choices and say, it's okay not to have control. You guys do it every single day with your MS. It's okay not to know what, what the next day is going to bring in terms of your MS. I can't control that, but the things I can control are staying on the medicines that I need to be staying on, making sure that I have the right diet, making sure that I'm getting exercise. If there's things that I need to do in terms of supplements, let's look at those and make sure I'm making healthy choices. If I choose chiropractic care, let's make sure that I'm doing it right and with the right people for the right reasons. Okay, so that's how we can take this and make it us and make us successful in what we're doing. So that self-management is key. Again, how can you do that? How can you take control of your health? Well, first of all, you have to be a good consumer. You know, I don't know, I, um, I don't know how it works these days, but the last car I bought, remember I talked about not even knowing if I liked the title, but the last car I bought, I did it all online. I did the, all the research online. I did all the shop online, look online, price online, find the reviews online. Um, I didn't really get to negotiate online, but I think you can these days uh, about that. Again, be your own best advocate. Learn and do your own research. Um, explore your own values. How do your values play into this? If you value your own health, you're gonna make good choices. If you value um, interpersonal relationships, you're gonna put the energy and the effort into that. Get support. Gather those people around you that can support you. And that's not always those with strong internal locuses of control. If you tend to have a lower locus, uh, more external locus of control, and you, you think you should su surround yourself with somebody that has a strong ex internal locus of control, sometimes that's not healthy. Because often you're intimidated by somebody that is so strong. And so again, it's coming to that realization and that partnership. You know, people that have really strong um, 
locuses, internal locuses of control tend to be a little bossy and they tend to think their ideas are only right. I have a sign on my door that says, um, I'm not bossy, I'm just right. Um, and so I think we have to realize and step back and say, you know, my ideas aren't going to help you. I might be able to give you suggestions, but they got to be you. I can encourage you. I can offer suggestions. I can give you a menu to choose from. But you internally have to value a change and choose to make the right choices. You really have to be your own best advocate. Advocate for yourself. Pay attention to your self-talk. What is your mind saying? What are you telling yourself? If you're always saying, I can't do that, or that won't work, or that doesn't seem like it's going to be work for me, maybe you need to evaluate that. And maybe you need to think, oh, why can't it work? What are my barriers? What is making it me stumble here? And really look through that and see, really, is it just an old bad habit saying that you can't do it, like my husband in the plumbing? Or really, can he learn a way to do that? And again, we're going to talk just a second here about that self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is a, um, a social cognitive theory, actually. It, it was, it's quoted up here. But it's really the belief in one's ability to accomplish a goal to be successful at something they start out with. And really to do that, you have to form a plan. First of all, you have to set a goal, you have to form a plan, and you have to believe in yourself. So I would say to you, set your goals. Make sure that you can visualize the end result. I think there's a, um, I don't know, a commercial I heard on the radio that talked about kind of essentially somebody sticking with a gym program. It, of course it was, you know, a sign up and pay a million dollars to go to the gym and look pretty clean in a club. But I think it, the, the, the bottom line was set a goal and make sure you can visualize that. This, this commercial talked about having a before picture and an after picture. And that's truly visualization. But maybe it is as several people noticed, maybe it is, I better get to therapy because my knee has been killing me lately and six people in this room noticed how I was limping already today. And so maybe my goal is, and my visualization is I can walk better, okay? Um, again, don't be, a fail a f don't be fearful of failure. Don't fear failure, fear should be about not trying. If you don't try, that should be your fear, not that you'll fail. And again, I will say, let your guard down. Talk to new people. Take a risk. Learn from others. And maybe have a little fun along the way as you're learning new things. That's the benefits of setting goals. I will tell you we have a wonderful exercise class uh, within the outpatient center that's connected to our center. One of the greatest benefits not only is exercise but the socialization and the ability to set group goals, group concerns, and use that as a support. Bottom line, believe in yourself. <laughs>